and something that really touched my heart, and I wanted to share it with you. Anytime we grow in grace or we learn more of God's Word, it's a wonderful thing. And, um, you know, I, I'm always encouraging people to to continue in the faith and to do things that help them to grow in God's grace. And this is one of those situations. Um, recently, I was listening to my pastor, and he was teaching on the subject of the, the Word of God. And what's interesting is... Um, I always learn something new from every time when I go through the scriptures. And God speaks to my mind, he speaks to my heart, he helps me to grow in the grace thereof. And pastor, my pastor, Ted Burrell, he brought out something I'd never heard before. And it just caused my mind to continue to keep going. And so I want to talk to you today about the power of God's word. We've heard, uh, or at least I have, and I'm sure you've heard messages on the word of God being the sword of the spirit. You know, in Ephesians chapter 6, it talks about take upon you the whole armor of God. And in the uh, verse, with the helmet of salvation, it also speaks about the word of God, which is the sword, you know, the sword of the spirit. But we also read in uh, Hebrews about the word of God being quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and of the joints and the marrow, and a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Now, when we get into these two passages, uh, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 17, and Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, when it's talking about the Word of God, one, Ephesians 6, 17, is talking about the Rhema. Now, if you've studied Greek or <clears throat> you're a student of Greek, you know that Ramoy means the spoken word of God. And this is a, an important thing that we need to understand, that Ephesians 6.17, when it says, take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, is talking about the spoken word of God, the Ramoy. Now, Jesus Christ is the word of God. The word became flesh. He dwelt among us. John chapter 1 tells us that. We beheld his glory as of the only begotten of the Father. Full. That means he had all grace, all truth. My friend, you can trust in Jesus Christ. He is our Savior. He is the, the Lord of our life. There's nothing greater than Jesus Christ. The whole world bows down and stops and celebrates Christmas. The only problem is, is the majority of the world has no idea what Christmas is truly about. It's about Jesus Christ and God the Father giving him to us as our redemption, to pay the price for our sins, to strengthen us, to lift us up, to give us the ability to live life. You know, this last week, I've really been taking a notice in <clears throat> how people live and how the hardness of hearts are. Uh, we had a, a man come to our house uh, begging just this last week. I've had this happen many times in the past. I'll take them to my closet and let them pick out whatever clothes they want if they fit. And uh, I'll take whatever cash I have, give it to them, drive them where they are, buy them groceries. I, I, we helped put this man <clears throat> into a home with his family. And he was actually deaf and dumb. He had to write everything down. He was unable to speak. He was unable to hear. And um, many times the heart of an individual is cold, and they don't understand about the love of Jesus Christ. Sometimes God will send an angel to you to test your faith. And the Bible tells us that many have entertained angels unaware. <clears throat> you see, the trying of your faith is much more precious than gold or silver. And trying means testing so you can grow. I mean, they, a metallurgist, um, I had the, the privilege, now this has been three decades ago, to talk to a metallurgist. My son-in-law is, is one, he, he works in a, foundry and he runs the foundry for the owner they mix metals there and then it's an incredibly complex situation because you have to have the right heat the right elements you have to have either the lack of hydrogen you know the addition of hydrogen in some aspects more air more helium to suck it out jesus christ is our refiner he doesn't test our faith or try our faith allow it to happen 
to make us fail. He does it to bring us more like him. And I'm telling you, the Christmas season is a time of great trial, great tribulation around the world. We are so blessed here in America, much more than any other place in the world. I'm thankful to be an American. I'm thankful to be born in this country. But the most important thing for me is I am thankful for what Jesus Christ has given me, himself and his life. So if you got your Bibles, I want to explain to you the power of the sword of the Spirit. I want to help you understand what the sword of the Spirit is about. So, Father, I do pray and ask that you bless them in your word. I pray that you bless each and every person listening. Lift them up, strengthen them, and wrap them with your Holy Spirit. And go before them, preparing the way. Touch their families. Lord, if they're unsaved, if they have loved ones, children, cousins, unsaved individuals, let the Holy Spirit flow through them, through the rainbow, through the power of the Spirit of God, and let it touch their hearts. In Christ's name I do pray. Amen. We're going to begin in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 17. And after I, I explain this verse, I will then go on to uh, Hebrews chapter 12. And you're going to see, or chapter 4, verse 12, you'll see the difference between the Word of God in Hebrews and the Word of God in Ephesians. In Hebrews, it's the Logon, the Logia, so, which is also Jesus Christ, but it's the written Word. There's a difference. So he tells them in verse 17 of Ephesians 6, he says, take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Now, you need to understand, these are joined together. The helmet is the helmet of salvation. When salvation comes upon you, God steals your mind. The phylactery was symbolized by, by the, the Jewish leaders, the Rabboni, Sanhedrin, you know, the Pharisees, Sadducees, those that were the people responsible for knowing and teaching the word of God. They would often put a phylactery around their head, and some of them that were very devout would put a box that would hang just above their eyes, right here. And in it, they would write in very tiny letters the Ten Commandments, and they would place them there so it was always upon their mind. Well, that comes from Deuteronomy chapter 6. And you see, we find out what the mark of the Antichrist is. You know, the the mark of the Antichrist. And what it is, it's it's when he seals your mind with almost Christ. It's a pseudo-Christ. It's a pseudo-Christ story. And it means another Christ or one who is just like, but not the real thing. Now, this is too old for many of you of today. But those of my generation would remember when they had commercials called The Real Thing, 7-Up, and other products. And that's because they were starting to do knockoff drinks in other companies companies, and people would want to have the real thing. I want to have the real thing in Christianity. The Antichrist is one that is just like, but you see, he is unable to touch the heart and to fill it with love. When you come to salvation, you are given a gift by Father, God the Father. You're given three gifts. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, he gives you faith, love, and charity. God the Father gives you faith. It's the Greek word pistuo, uh, P-I-S-T-E-U-O in the English. And what it means is the ability to commit to. It doesn't mean you understand it completely. Because let's face it, I've, I've been studying the Bible for over 30 years now. I'm not even scratching the surface. John MacArthur, you know, R.C. Sproul, great theologians, they're just scratching the surface. I love to listen to them. I love to listen to Robbie Zacharias. But my friend, the word of God is so deep. He gives us what we need and he gives us what we want. You will have, like A.W. Tozer would say, as much God in your life as you want. Your heart's desire will be fulfilled. God will let you drink from that fountain of his Holy Spirit, the Lord Jesus Christ, as much as you want. The Father gives you the ability to believe. Salvation is a gift of God. And this word believe is pishio. There's two words for believe in the Greek. The devils believe in God, but with fear and trembling. That's the word gnosis. Now that means they know him personally. They have seen him. They have looked upon the wonderful Savior in all his glory and magnificence. But instead of committing to him, they fear him and they tremble because they oppose him and don't want any of it. And you see, that's the rebellious spirit that's in mankind today. We want our own way. It's a Burger King generation. They have it your own way. 
Uh, many people want Christianity their own way. But you see, when you commit, when God the Father gives you pistuo, you commit your whole heart. When you seek for Christ with your whole heart, you shall find him. Why? Because God gives you the grace. He gives you the pistuo, God the Father, to commit to the Son. The Son gives you the second gift. All people receive these three gifts of the Holy Spirit, faith, hope, and charity. Hope is Jesus Christ. He gives you himself. The Bible tells us in Psalm 22, he said, I was hope, and it means the hope of all creation, while I was upon my mother's breast. We are celebrating the Christmas season this year, and it's when Jesus came and was born as an infant, the greatest gift given to mankind. And he was the hope. Hope doesn't mean something that you wish it happens, you know, you're, you're iffy, you're just praying it'll happen. No, in, in the Greek and in the Hebrew, it means it is something that is firm, solid, you can count on. It is a foundation that will never pass nor be destroyed. Jesus Christ gave himself the hope for all mankind. And then we have the gift of the Holy Spirit, which is faith, hope, and charity. Charity is the root of reason. And the Holy Spirit comes in. And when he does, he gives you the agape. That is the love for God and the love for others. You see, God touches your heart and circumcises it and changes it. Read in Jeremiah about hearts without Christ and God are as hard as Adam and Eve. Means they won't be moved. They only do what they want. But the heart that has come to God, when the Holy Spirit comes in, it cuts out that dead flesh and makes a sensitive heart so that you can feel compassion for others. And by the way, I want to thank you all for your prayers. I had uh, like six pounds of water come off my lungs and heart. The VA wanted me to go to the hospital, but um, I told them I'd rather die at home. And, you know, they called and said, so you're refusing treatment? And I said, yes, because I trust in the power of God. What's going to be is going to be. We need to live each day so that we're ready to see our Savior. But I want to thank you because it's, it's good to be able to breathe again. And I, I praise God for that. So... He gives us the ability to live. The Holy Spirit doesn't just give you an agape, a passion to love God and others. But he gives you the fruit, singular. This means it's all one. I remember when you this zebra gum came out when I was a kid. and I don't even know if they make it anymore. I'm getting pretty old. Uh, at least I don't feel old, but people tell me I look old. And this, this pack of gum had all the different flavors of fruit in it. Now, my sister would get it, and she would only give me the flavors that she didn't like. But you know what? Everything in the Holy Spirit's good. He gives you love for God and others. Joy. This is that stirring in your heart that keeps you happy no matter what happens. Peace. I'm telling you, the older I get, the more the peace of God takes over my life. It will in yours, too. The closer you get to God, the more you'll have peace. I met a, a man at the, uh, he was working at a lumberyard, and uh, I started talking to him, and he didn't have to tell me he was a Christian. He had the peace of God on him and the love flowing out of him. I, he had to be at least 65 to 80 years old. And I thanked God when I left. I said, thank you for letting me meet him, Lord. He was such a blessing to show the love of Christ in the way that he worked. Love, joy, peace, meekness. I mean, subduing your own strength, allowing God to work. Gentleness, goodness, long-suffering, temperance. All of the, the fruit of the Spirit, singular in Galatians, is ours to take. And, sorry for that. Uh, so let's take a look here. You get a gift from the Father, a gift from the Son, and a gift from the Holy Spirit. When he comes in, he brings it. This all happens, and he says, so take the helmet of salvation. Now, friend... What's interesting is you already have it, but this is the word dekomai. And it means grab it with your hands. You already have it. It's been given to you. So take and use it. It doesn't just mean to take a hold of, but what it also means is grant access to a visitor and do not refuse what they would call intercourse or conversation with others or friendship. So when it says, take the helmet of salvation, 
It means you take that helmet and you tell others about it. You ask them to put it on. That's literally what the word means. Yekomai. So you see, we're not supposed to be hiding our salvation. That's the individual that I'm supposed to be counseling in Australia. I'll get to you. So my friend, if you're truly born again, you have the salvation of God. Now what's interesting is when people would see soldiers marching, their, their shield would be on their backs or carried by the shield bearer, and they would have it on their backs. So you wouldn't see the shield. Swords would often be sheep. But what you would see is the sun glinting off those shields or, or those helmets. And you see, that's the way it is. When people see you and you have the helmet of salvation, they see your Christianity. They see Christ living in you. Just like the man at the lumber yard, 65, 80 years old, maybe even older. I mean, he was old. But the Holy Spirit was flowing through him. It was evident to me and to anybody else that could identify God's child that he had the helmet of salvation. He also had placards up all around his store that were Bible verses. The stores would all abandon because the bigger places would run him out of business. But you know what? The testimony of Christ is there. That's the most important thing. So take the helmet of salvation and share it. Now it's linked. This this word for and it's it's the word kaya. And it's not breaking the sentence. So when it says take the helmet of salvation and it actually means indeed, indeed, the sword of the spirit, the word of God. Gives you salvation. Faith, which means pistuo, committing yourself to God, comes by hearing and hearing only by the word of God. This means the spoken word, the rhema. So he says, take the helmet of salvation, indeed, which is the sword of the spirit. Now this word for sword, it doesn't mean the long Thracian sword spoken of in Revelations or in other places, because they had big swords that when they would run, the Romans would throw the first row, and it would be like four to five feet long, and it would fly. And they say that it would literally, if it hit you here, it would split you almost in half. The Thracian sword was considered to be a javelin, but it was actually a sword, like a banana chopper you'd see in the Philippines, that would just chop people in half. This is talking about the makara. In Hebrew and Greek, the makara was a sword that was used specifically by the priesthood for sacrificial offerings unto God. It was a, a large knife. That's why it falls under the word of sword here in the English. It, was, it would be like a butcher knife, we'd call it today. But it was the one that was specifically used for sacrificing animals, cutting them up to be portioned out. This, the makara of the new boy. Sword of the Spirit. And you say, well, why would the Lord use the word Sword of the Spirit here with the Makra, which is the Word of God? Because, my friend, Jesus Christ is the, the Ramoy, the spoken word. And see, that's how we share the helmet of salvation. That's how we share the word, which is the sacrificial word. And it means something that is going to be sacrificed unto God. When you give your life to the Lord Jesus Christ, you have become a sacrifice unto God. And see, that's what the sword of the Spirit does. It goes right into your heart. And faith comes by hearing, and hearing only by the word of God, the ramoy, the spoken word of God. When you speak God's word, it will not be void. It will not return void. It will always do that for which it has been sent out to accomplish. God's word touches the heart and people will give themselves as a living sacrifice to the Lord God. That's what this is talking about. So it's the Remoya Theon. It means the Holy Spirit, Father, and the Son all working together. Spoken word of God. So there is power in that. 
Okay? There is power in the Word of God, and many people don't take advantage of it. They don't understand the need for, for sharing their salvation, um, especially if they're like a Dorsian Calvinist or what they call a fatalistic individual, which says God's going to save them anyway. You know, it's not up to me or you. You know, when, when uh, John Patton went to the New Hebrews uh, cannibals, he tried to get support from his church. Congregational. This is the latter aspect of the 1800s, mid 1800s, and they didn't like the heathens. They didn't think the heathens deserved salvation. I mean, who should go to pygmies and cannibals? And, and the new breeds, they were very short people, but they were fierce. And they were cannibals because there was no meat left on the island. So they would even dig up bodies. Uh, they let the bodies be in the ground two or three days, so they would tenderize and they would eat them then, dig them up and. Barbecue, that's where our soldiers learned to barbecue, was from these cannibals, because they would slow cook things. Because the human body takes a long time to break down. You're not supposed to eat people. But here's the thing. They told him to sit down, young man. If God chooses to save the heathen, he'll do it without you or me. But you see, they didn't know the Bible. Because the Bible is very plain. We're supposed to tell the gospel to all people. We're supposed to have the love of Christ emanating from us, and you will. Just commit yourself afresh to God. And there's power in it. The sword of the Spirit will touch the heart of that person. They will become a sacrifice that means divided up between God. And you say, what do you mean divided up? God will cut out the things that are not needed. It's called the sanctification of the Holy Spirit. God sanctifies you, makes you holy. And you become a sweet-smelling savor before his throne that rises before him. So that's the sword of the Spirit. It's tied to the helmet of salvation. We get over to Hebrews chapter 4, and the verse 12 says, For the word of God is quick, powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing of soul and spirit. And of the joints, the marrow, it is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Now, this is the written word. It's what are we supposed to be speaking? The written word of God. That's what the word logon means. But Jesus Christ, in the beginning, was the word. In the beginning was the logos. Arche and logon. Logon and logeia. Logeia and theon. Theon. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God, Jesus Christ. The Word became flesh. So he is the written Word. He has given us the Bible, which is Jesus Christ in written. And guess what? When it says that it is quick, this means how it deals with your spirit. It's, it's the word zeo. Uh, in English, it's, it's D-Z-A hyphen O. But in the Greek, to, to, to say Zao, what it literally means is it will bring you life. You know, when the Apostle Paul was dying in prison, he was freezing, he was cold, he was hungry. He said, bring me a cold, but most importantly, bring me the parchments. He wanted the word of God. Nothing comforts a person in the time of need better than God's word. Why? Because the power of the Holy Spirit's in it, and God speaks to us through his written word. It's powerful. Not only does it bring life, and I'm telling you, there's been many times in my life where I needed life brought into me. Uh, it just You die so many times and get brought back. You need that life. But it's not just being brought back. It's to live each and every day. You need that life of God. And, and this word powerful is the word Energies. It's where we get the word energy. And what it means is it's quick. It'll bring you life. And powerful means it'll give you the energy to live that life. It will give you the, the motivation. It will give you the intent of God in your life. The will of God for your life. The desire of God to be active in your life. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. Now, I really get a kick out of this word sharper. It's the word tomoteros. Yeah, like the vegetable, tomotia. Tomoteros. I don't know how 
why it sounds so similar to the uh, Latin name for a tomato or derivative tomato. But what it means is it's sharper. It means it will cut within a single stroke. I have seen cutlery uh, and that has been so sharp that it will literally, you can take a piece of paper and just slide it and it'll just like fall apart. This is also the Makara. It's not talking about the Thracy, it's not talking about the long two-edged sword. I've heard so many pastors preach this wrong. They talk about it being the long Roman sword and they do the same thing with Ephesians. It is not that long Roman double sword. It is the little or the butcher knife of the priest. Now, when they would debone, they didn't use the one edge, they used the double edge. They have a serration on one side sometimes, but usually it was a plain double edge. But each side was razor sharp, so that when they pushed it in, it sliced both ways. And that's what it means here. It divides your soul and spirit. This is the word newborn. God will give you the life and he'll give you the energy to live it. And it will divide the soul from that. Now what this means, the word soul, of course, is, is suke. And it means it will partition or separate. The, the soul is the part of mankind that is called in theology the volitional. It, it is that which we voluntarily, it's our own will, choose to do right or choose to do wrong, choose to do this or choose to do that. It divides the soul and the spirit. Just like it does joints and marrow when they're cleaning out the sacrifice or the animal to be consumed. It judges, the word discerning here means judges whether it's fit or not. I worked with an individual not too long ago, and, and they called me and were talking to me. And they were saying, you know, Pastor Tom, I committed this sin, and I am so filled with shame and horror, and I don't even like telling you about it. And, you know, people are normal. We all sin. We are going to sin till the day Jesus takes us out of his fleshly body. But you know what was important was the person was convicted. That shows me they're born again. That shows me they want the power of God in their life. You see, that's what the Holy Spirit and the Word of God does. It will show you what's wrong and show you also what is right, what's fit for the kingdom of God. Now, it's two-edged. You can't just know what's right, but you have to stand for it. Jesus is the Word of God. He is the truth. Now, here's where many Christians fall short. We're willing to tell people, what we believe, but when it becomes time, not too many are willing to stand for it. You know, I, I don't hate gays, I don't hate bisexuals, I don't hate anybody. I don't condone their lifestyles. And you know what the Bible teaches? Many people will say, well, God hates the sin, but not the sinner. That's not true. Um, if you want, I'll do a video and show you from the Psalms and, and other places of the Bible. God hates the sinner just as much. He hates those that hate him. He detests and hates the sin. He hates the sinner too. He loves you when you turn to him and seek salvation. From that point forward, you're no longer a sinner, but your sins are nailed to the cross of Christ. And from that point forward, he deals with you as a child. I have led many people from the homosexual lesbian lifestyle to salvation. And the power of God will change them, convert them. I mean, in mid-prayer, I've seen many of them, their voices change. You know, I've never... I've, I've led many people that were thieves, and, and I've led some really bad people to salvation, the kind that would cut your throat or your fingers off to get your, your rings. And I've seen them become the nicest people in the world. Because that's what the Holy Spirit does. He takes control of your decision ability, but you will start standing for righteousness. Too many Christians are afraid to hurt somebody's feelings. Do you know what? If you truly love somebody, you would tell them about salvation. You would worry more about them spending an eternity in hell than whether they would be offended by you telling them Jesus is the only way. So many people are afraid to offend Muslims. Do you understand that most Muslims, it is a religion of hate, a religion of violence. I mean, they will sodomize their daughters and call them virgins because they haven't 
done anything to the front side. Um, there's a sect, probably 30% of them, that mutilate their daughters. They're horrible. It's a satanic religion. The word Allah in Hebrew means who wants to be like the sun. It's the word for Satan. One of the names for Satan. He will never be like the sun. Jesus Christ is the capital S-U-N, the son of righteousness. And he brings healing in his wings. Allah is a, is a religion proponed by Satan. That's why it's so abusive, so hatred, so filled with violence. Those countries that are all Islamic, if it was a religion of love, they wouldn't be walking around with AK-47s and strapping bombs to their children. They wouldn't want to kill Christians that they don't know or Jews that they've never met just because they're a Christian or a Jew. There's two ways that they do jihad. It's written right out of the Quran. One is they go in and take it by force. They did that in Turkey. They slaughtered the Christians, and then they took their hats off their heads and dipped it in the blood of the Christians as it ran down the hill. And then they put it on their head, and they went, nah, 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 and they spun in circles with the fez, and it would shake the blood everywhere. That's the Shriner hat. And that's why it has the sword and the eastern star. The star is symbol of Satan. The star up always represents Satan, the star down, Ashtaroth. So it's the religion of Satan. Now, my friend, Christianity is a religion of love. If you truly love somebody, you will tell them the word of God. You will live the word of God. The, the sword of the spirit is when we speak the word of God and we share salvation with others. The word of God is when we stand upon what God has written and we don't compromise. History is filled with people who are martyrs because they would not compromise the word of God. I'm praying for a pastor in Iran right now who simply because he will not renounce Christ publicly and confess the Islamic religion, he's being tortured daily and nightly, they don't give him rest. They haven't killed him because they want him to go before the people so that his influence, they'll show them that Christianity is a fraud. You know, I, I had a, a Farsi um, from Iran when I was a pastor in Illinois. Uh, he came over and they tried, literally, the Muslims ran him off the road on his way to, to get down to Sandwich, Illinois, um, in Palos Heights. And they almost got him. They did end up getting him, um, by the way. Um, but they they hate people that preach the truth. The word of God is something we should stand on. We should say, you know, it's not right to steal. I'm a Christian, I don't steal, but when somebody else steals, we need to confront them with it. And say, you know, there's a better way. You shouldn't do this. If you need something, just ask. I've been ripped off so many times. And the thing is, if they would just ask, I'd give it to them. You know, people are more important than objects. They're more important than anything else in this world. We're not going to take the clothes on your back. You're not going to take your car, your convertible, your boat, your house. Don't you want to take your children, your wife, your grandchildren? Don't you want to take those you meet? Don't you want to see everybody enjoying the benefits of heaven? You see, there's right and there's wrong. There's good and there is evil. And um, I was in a, a store uh, yesterday in, in Dollar General, and I was very busy, and there was a young girl working the register, and they were backed up, and a guy came in with his hoodie pulled down, and his new rough part of town, totally covered, and he was scoping the place out. She didn't realize it, but I watched him. He went to the manager's office. He was in there three or four minutes. He'd come out, and he'd come walking down the side aisle, like to the side, and he looked up. Because I was watching, we made eye contact. He tried to stare me down. And so it was just a battle of wills, staring at each other. And, you know, in love, I had six tubes of cock. I was going to take and impale one into his throat if he tried to burglarize the place. But the thing is, because you don't, as a Christian, you don't do evil, but you stand against evil. See, that's where people have problems. The Bible says a man that does not provide, it's the word protect, his wife and children, is worse than an unbeliever. 
God expects a man to be a man. I will not stand by and watch women and children hurt or abuse or even weak men. And I worked in the prison system with some of the worst offenders from the Midwest, but they would ship them in from Indiana and stuff. Guys, I was I was the chaplain at, at uh, DHS in, in Juliet. These men had served their time, but were so violent and so offensive, they weren't allowed to be released back to the public. They were uh, psychopaths. But many of them came to salvation. I knew they came to salvation because then they would start confessing what their thoughts were and what they had done. You know, one man was in there for uh, murdering two children. But after I led him to salvation, God changed his heart. And then he went in front and he talked about seven different states over a 30-year period. He killed over 200 children. He was never going to see the light of day. But his conscience was clean and he ended up getting murdered after confessing that before he got to go before the judge. Uh, prisoners do things like that. But he's in heaven today. Let me ask you something. Do you understand the power of the sword of the spirit? The sword of the spirit is when God gave you salvation. He put it in your mind. You know the word of God. You know the heart of God. You may not understand all the complexities of God. I certainly don't. But I can tell you how I got saved. I threw the two men out of my house that night. Uh, Steve, teacher, Bob Johnson. They came in, gave me the gospel. I was... I was a, a rough individual. I listened to them, but my mind was thinking about smoking and chewing. I took them by the arms, walked to the front door, and tossed them over my porch. But when I went back in my room, it's like God spoke to me. Everything they said hit me, me like a ton of bricks. And I got down on my knees, and I gave my heart to the Lord. And it was like... Ten thousand pounds came off my back. I had never, I had never felt such love and joy in my life as I did at that moment. I wanted everybody to experience salvation. I still do. Friend, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, would you pray this prayer? True God and Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, I know that I'm a sinner, but I believe Jesus died for my sin. I'm asking you to forgive me of my sins and for Jesus Christ to come in my heart and be the Lord of my life. I accept you as my personal Lord and Savior. In Christ Jesus' name I do pray. Amen. If you've prayed that prayer, share it with somebody today. Find a Bible-believing, teaching church. Lord bless you, my friends. I hope you understand the power of the Word of God today. May you enjoy this Christmas season. May the smile of God, the caris of God, the anam caris, be upon you. And may you always rejoice in the life that you've been given. Until that day we meet on the other side where the streets are of gold, may Christ bless you and fully enrich your lives. Amen.